This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Chris Gorringe. The Glugs of Gosh by C. J. Dennis. Book 9. The Rhymes of Sim. Nobody knew why it should be so. Nobody knew or wanted to know. It might have been checked had but somebody dared to trace its beginnings, but nobody cared. But t'was clear to the wise that the glugs of those days were crazed beyond reason concerning a craze. They would pass a thing by for a week or a year with an air apathetic or maybe a sneer. Some everyday thing like a crime or a creed, a mode or a movement, and pay it small heed till somebody started to lord it aloud. Then all but the nobodies followed the crowd. Thus Sim was a craze, though to give him his due he would rather have strayed from the popular view. But once the glugs had him, they held him so tight that he could not be nobody, try as he might. He had to be somebody, so they decreed, for craze is an appetite governed by greed. So on Saturday week, to the great market square, came every glug who could rake up his fare. They came from the suburbs, they came from the town, they came from the country, glugs bearded and brown. Rich glugs with cigars, all well tailored and stout, jostled commonplace glugs who dropped eight years about. There were gushing glug maids, well aware of their charms, and stern massive matrons with babes in their arms. There were querulous dames who complained of the squash, the pushing and squeezing, for, briefly, all gosh, with its aunt and its wife stood agape in the ranks, excepting Sir Stodge and his satellite swanks. The mayor of Quog took the chair for the day, and he made them a speech, and he ventured to say that a glug was a glug, and the cause they held dear was a very dear cause, and the glug said, Hear, hear! Then Sim took the stage to a round of applause from thousands who suddenly found they had a cause. The First Rhyme of Sim We strive together in life's crowded mart, keen-eyed with clutching hands to our reach. We scheme, we lie, we play the selfish part, making our lust for gain with gentle speech, and masking too, O oh, pity ignorance, our very selves behind a careless glance. Our foolish brothers, seeking e'er in vain the one dear gift at the lace so near at hand, hoping to barter gold we meanly gain for that the poorest beggar in the land holds for his own, to hoard while yet he spends, seeking fresh treasure in the hearts of friends. We preach, yet do we deem it worldly wise to count unbounded brother love a shame? So ban the brother look from out our eyes, lest sparks of sympathy be fanned to flame. We smile, and yet withhold, in secret fear, the words so hard to speak, so sweet to hear. The open sesame to meanest hearts, the magic word to which stern eyes grow soft, and crafty faces that the cruel marts have seared and scorned, turn gentle. Nay, how oft it trembles on the lip to Dion's poke, And dawning love is stifled with a joke. Nay, brothers, look about your world to-day, A world to you so drab, so commonplace, The flowers still are blooming, by the way, As blossom smiles upon the sternest face. In every hour is born some thought of love, In every heart is hid some treasure trove. With a modified clapping and stamping of feet, the glugs mildly cheered him as Sim took his seat. But some said, "'Twas clever,' and some said, "'Twas grand,' more especially those who did not understand. And some said with frowns, though the words sounded plain, yet it had a deep meaning they craved to explain. But the mayor said, "'Silence! He wished to observe that a glug was a glug, and in wishing to serve this glorious cause which they had asked him to lead, they had proved they were glugs of the noble old breed that made gosh what it was, and he had asked the police to remove that small boy while they heard the next piece. The Second Rhyme of Sim Now come, said the devil, 
he said to me, with his swart face all a grin, This day, ere ever the clock strikes three, shall you sin your darling sin. For I've wagered a crown with Beelzebub, down there at the gentleman's Brimston Club. I shall tempt you once, I shall tempt you twice, yet thrice shall you fall, ere I tempt you thrice. Be gone, base devil, I made reply, be gone with your fiendish grin. How hope you to profit by such as I, for I have no darling sin. But many there be, and I know them well, all foul with sinning and ripe for hell. And I name no names, but the whole world knows that I am never of such of those. How now, said the devil, I'll spread my net, and I'll vow I'll gather you in. By this and by that shall I win my bet, and you shall sin the sin. Come, fill up a bumper of good red wine, your heart shall sing and your eyes shall shine. You shall know such joy as you have never known, for the salving of men was the good vine grown. Be gone, red devil, I made reply, parch shall these lips of mine, and my tongue shall shrink and my throat go dry ere ever I taste your wine. But greet you shall, as I know full well, a tipsy score of my friends in hell. And I name no names, but the whole world wots, most of my fellows are drunken sots. Aha, said the devil, you scorn the wine, thrice shall you sin, I say, to win me a crown from a friend of mine ere three o'clock this day. Are you calling to mind some lady fair, and is she the wife, or a maiden rare? To a folly to shackle young love, hot youth, and stolen kisses are sweet, forsooth. Be gone, foul devil, I made reply, for never in all my life have I looked on a woman with lustful eye, be she maid, or widow, or wife. But my brothers, alas, I am scandalized by their evil passions so ill disguised, and I name no names, but my thanks I give that I loathe the lives my fellow men live. Ho, ho, roared the devil in fiendish glee, tis a silver crown I win. Thrice have you fallen, O Pharisee, you have sinned your darling sin. But nay, said I, and I scorn your lure. I have sinned no sin, and my heart is pure. Come, show me a sign of the sin you see. But the devil was gone, and the clock struck three. With an increase of cheering and waving of hats, while the little boy squealed and made noises like cats, the glugs gave approval to Sim's second rhyme, and some said twas thoughtful. And some said twas prime, and some said twas witty and had a fine end, more especially those who did not comprehend. And some said with leers and with nudges and shrugs that they mentioned no names, but it hit certain glugs. And others remarked with superior smiles while dividing the metrical feet into miles that the thing seemed quite simple without any doubt, but the anagrams in it would need thinking out. But the mayor said, Hush! And he wished to explain that in leading this movement he had nothing to gain. He was ready to lead, since they trusted him so, and wherever he led he was sure Glugs would go. And he thanked them again, and he craved peace for a time, while this gifted young man read his third and last rhyme. To sing you a song, and a sensible song, is a worthy and excellent thing. But how could I sing you that sort of a song if there's never a song to sing? At ten to the tick by the kitchen clock, I marked him blundering by, with his eyes astare, and his rumpled hair, and his hat cocked o'er his eye. Blind in his quest, to his shoes untied, he went with a swift jig jog, off on the quest with a strange unrest, hunting the feasible dog. And this is the song, as he dashed along, that he sang with a swaggering swing. Now how had I heard him singing a song, if he had a song to sing? I found the authentic, identical beast, the feasible dog, and the terror of Gosh. I know by the prowl of him, hark to the growl of him, heralding death to the subject of Splosh. Oh, look at him glaring and staring by thunder. Now each for himself, and the weakest goes under. Beware this injurious, furious brute. He's ready to rend you with tooth and with claw. Though tis incredible, anything edible disappears suddenly into his maw. In his cavernous inner interior vanishes everything strictly superior. He calls it woman, he calls it wine, he calls it devils and dice, he calls it surfing and Sunday golf and names that are not so nice. But whate'er he calls it, morals or mirth, he is on it with the hunt right quick. For his sorrow he'd hug like a gloomy glig if he hadn't a dog to kick. 
to any old knight, if the stars are right, you will find him hot on the trail of a feasible dog and a teasable dog with a candor tied to his tail. And the song that he roars to the shuddering stars is a worthy and excellent thing. Yet how could you hear him singing the song if there wasn't a song to sing? I've watched this anonymous, onomous shape abroad in the land while the nation has slept marked his satanical methods tyrannical rigorous vigorous vigil i kept good gracious voracious is hardly the name for it yet we have only our blindness to blame for it my dear i've autoptical optical proof that he's prowling and growling at large in the land hear his pestiferous clamour vociferous gurgles and groans of the beastliest brand some may regard his contortions as comical but I've the proof that his game's gastronomical. Beware this obstreperous, leprous beast, a treacherous wretch, for I know him of old. I'm on the track of him, close at the back of him, and I'm aware his ambitions are bold. For he's yearning and burning to snare the superior into his roomy and gloomy interior. Such a shouting and yelling of hearty bravos, such a craning of necks and a standing of toes, seemed to leave never doubt that the tinker's last rhyme had won him repute mid the glugs for all time. And they all said the rhyme was the grandest they'd heard, most especially those who had not caught a word. But the mayor said peace, and he stood without fear, as the leader of all to whom justice was dear. For the tinker had rhymed, as the prophet foretold, and a light was let in on the errors of old, for in every line and in every verse was the proof that Sir Stodge was a traitor, and worse. Sir Stodge, said the mayor, must go from his place, and the swanks, one and all, were a standing disgrace, for the influence won o'er a weak, foolish king was a menace to gosh and a scandalous thing. And now, said the mayor, I stand here today as your leader and friend, and the glug said, Hooray! Then they went to their homes in the suburbs and town, to their farms with the glugs who were bearded and brown. Portly gugs with cigars went to dine at their clubs, while illiterate glugs had one more at the pubs. And each household in Gosh sat and talked half the night of the wonderful day and the imminent fight. Forgetting the rhymer, forgetting his rhymes, they talked of Sir Stodge and his numerous crimes. There was hardly a glug in the whole land of Gosh a lenient word to put in for King Splosh. One and all to the manifest surliest dog were quite eager to bark for his worship of Quog. Forgotten, unnoticed, Sim wended his way to his lodging in Gosh at the end of the day, and was there to his friend and companion of years, to his little red dog with the funny prick ears, that he poured out his woe, seeking nothing to hide, and the little dog listened, his head on one side. Oh, you little red dog, you are weary as I. It is days, it is months since we saw the blue sky. And it seems weary years since we sniffed at the breeze, as it hums through the hedges and sings in the trees. These we know and we love, but this city holds fears, oh, my friend of the road, with the funny prick ears. And for what may we hope from his worship of quag? Oh, a bone and a kick, said the little red dog. 10. The Debate He was a glug of simple charm. He wished no living creature harm. His kindly smile like sunlight fell on all about and wished them well. Yet spite the cheerful soul of Sim, the great Sir Stodge detested him. The stern Sir Stodge and all his swanks, proud glugs of diverse grades and ranks, with learning and attainments great, had never learned to conquer hate and failing in their A, B, C, were whipped by master destiny. Thus t'was that Gosh's famous schools turned out great hordes of learned fools, turned out the ship without a sail, turned out the kite with leaden tail, turned out the mind that could not soar because of foolish weights it bore. Because there'd been no farther joy to guide the quick mind of the boy away from thoughts of hate and blame, wisdom in these was but a name, but mid the glugs they count him wise who walks with cunning in his eyes. His task well done, his three rhymes writ, Sim rose at morn and packed his kit. At last he cried, off and away, to meet again the spendthrift day, 
as he comes climbing in the east to bless with largesse man and beast again the fields where wild things run and trees all spreading to the sun run not because of all things blessed their chosen place contents them best oh come my little prick-eared dog but halt exclaimed his nibs of quag nay said the mare not so fast the day climbs high but sinks at last and trees all spreading to the sun are slain because they cannot run the great sir stodge filled full of hate has challenged you to hold debate on monday in the market square he and his swanks will all be there sharp to the tick at half past two to knock the stuffing out of you and if your stuffing so be spread then is the cause of quog stone dead in this debate i'd have you find with all the cunning of your mind sure victory for quog's great cause and swift feet for stodge's laws but cunning have i none quoth sim the mayor slowly winked at him ah cried his worship sly so sly again he dropped his dexter eye i've read you though i've marked you well you're cunning as nymph from hell nay keep your tempter for i can with all admire a clever man who rhymes with such a subtle art may never claim a simple part i'll make of you a glug of rank with something handy in the bank and fixed opinions which you know with fixed deposits always go i'll give you anything you crave a great high headstone to your grave a salary a scarlet coat a handsome wife a house a vote a title or a humbled foe but sim said no and ever no then shouted quog your aid i claim for gosh and in your country's name i bid you fight the cause of quog or be forever named a dog the cause of quog the wheel of gosh are one are men down with king splosh sim looked his worship in the eye as solemnly he made reply if tis to serve my native land on monday i shall be at hand but what am i mid such great men his worship winked his eye again twas monday in the market square sir stodge and all his swanks were there and almost every glug in gosh had bolted lunch and had a wash and cleaned his boots and sallied out to gloat upon sir stodge's rout and certain sly and knowing glugs with sundry nudges winks and shrugs passed round the hint and that up on high behind some window near the sky where he could see yet not be seen king splosh was present with the queen glugs said the chairman glugs of gosh by order of our good king splosh the tinker and sir stodge shall meet and here without unseemly heat debate the question of the day which is however let me say i do not wish to waste your time so first shall speak this man of rhyme and when sir stodge has voiced his view the glugs shall judge between the two this verdict from the folk of gosh will be accepted by king splosh and when like teasing vagabonds the sly winds buffet sullen ponds the face of stodge grew dark with rage when sim stepped forth upon the stage but all the glugs with one accord a chorus of approval roared said sim kind friends and fellow glugs my trade is mending pots and mugs i tinker kettles and i rhyme to please myself and pass the time just as my fancy wandereth he's mine quoth stodge below his breath said sim why i am here to-day i know not though i've heard them say that strife and hatred play some part in this great meeting at the mart nay brothers why should hatred lodge that's ultra virus thundered stodge tis ultra virus cried the knight besides it isn't half polite and e'en the dullest glug should know tis not pro bono publico nay glugs this fellow has no class remember vincit veritas with sidelong looks and sheepish grins like men found out in secret sins glug gazed at glug in nervous dread till one with claims to learning said sir stodge is talking greek you know he may be mad but never low then those who had no word of greek felt lifted up to hear him speak ah learning learning others said it is fine to have a clever head and here and there a nervous cheer was heard and someone growled hear hear kind friends said sim but at a glance the cute sir stodge had seen his chance 
Quid nuncle, he cried, oh noble glugs, this fellow takes you all for mugs. I ask him, where's his quid pro quo? I ask again, quo womanto. Shall this man filch our wits must with his furor poeticus? Nay, cried Sir Stodge, you must agree, if you will hark a while to we, and at the glug's collective head he flung strange language, ages dead, with mystic phrases from the law, with many an old and rusty saw, with well-worn mottoes which he took haphazard from the copy-book, for half an hour the learned knight belaboured them with all his might. And as they wakened from their days, their murmurs grew to shouts of praise, Glugs who'd reviled him overnight, all in a moment saw the light. O oh, learned man, O oh, seer, cried they, and education won the day. Then quickly to Sir Stodge's side there bounded, in a nimble stride, his nibs of quag, and flinging wide his arms, O oh, victory, he cried, I'm with Sir Stodge, O oh, Glugs of Gosh, and we have won. Long live King Splosh. Then pointing angrily at Sim, cried quag, This is the end of him. For months I've marked his crafty dodge to bring dishonour to Sir Stodge. I've lured him here, the traitorous dog, and shamed him, quoth his nibs of quag. Hoots for the tinker tore the air, and Sim went wisely otherwhere. Cheers for Sir Stodge were loud and long, and as amid his swanks he bowed to mark his thanks and honest pride, his nibs of quag bowed by his side. The Thursday after that, at three, the king invited Quog to tea. Quoth Quog, it was a task to bilk, I thank you, sugar please, and milk, to bilk this tinker and his pranks, a scurvy rogue, ah, two lumps, thanks. A scurvy rogue, continued Quog, t'was easy to outwit the dog, although perhaps I risked my life, I've heard he's handy with a knife. Ah well, t'was for my country's sake, thanks, just one slice of covent cake. End of book ten.